Okay, so um, first I'm gonna talk at you and then I'm gonna give you something to look at. So uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Leila Tonak. And in case you haven't read the abstract in our brochure, uh, my project examines the feminist concept of intersectionality through the work of four visual artists and one art historian. As some of you may know, intersectionality is a term first coined in 1989 by the feminist civil rights activist and legal scholar Kimberly Crenshaw, initially coined to provide an analytic framework for the double jeopardy experienced by women of color. Um, I'm gonna let her define it for you, uh, as she should. In a recent interview, she said, intersectionality is a lens through which you can see where power comes and collides, where it interlocks and intersects. It's not simply that there's a race problem here, a gender problem here, and a class or LGBTQ problem there. Many times, that framework erases what happens to people who are subject to all of these things. I'm a painter, and in many ways, my Keystone project has been about negotiating the gap between artist and scholar. As a scholar, or at least an aspiring one, I was reluctant to undertake a project related to my creative field in a direct way. I wanted to establish myself concretely as capable of both artistic and more traditionally academic pursuits. I stuck staunchly to the idea of a project based on extensive research and an expert theoretical framework. I set my sights on interviewing high profile feminist academics and politicians. And yet, I began the project fundamentally as an artist, or at least an aspiring one. I had a vision that appeared to me almost ready-made, irrespective of feasibility. I imagined my project in the film medium. Uh, despite the fact that I had no experience with the many technological and practical demands of filmmaking, of which there are many. Uh, the decision to shift my project to interviewing visual artists served me both practically and conceptually. My interviewee's position as artist made them more accessible to me as an art student with an already established network of accomplished artists at my disposal but it also complicated and enriched the discussion I wanted to have about theory, politics, and gender. So much of the art world is shaped by social critique, and yet visual artists are perhaps not the demographic we have come to expect to be consulted in a politically oriented documentary film. But with the canon of art history traditionally excluding, silencing, and problematically representing women and other minorities, Artists who embody these identities and their intersections have a uniquely reciprocal and historically informed relationship with the feminist movement. Furthermore, I realized that the particular concepts of intersectionality I wanted to hone in on in my project were perfectly paralleled by the multifaceted practices of postmodern contemporary studio artists, and that their practices were interrogating the very same questions of privilege, voice, and representation that I saw being played out on the political stage. The truth is that everything I am drawn to academically finds its way into my painting eventually, and vice versa. By allowing myself to cultivate a symbiotic relationship between the two, I was able to uncover entirely new skills. I have discovered new strengths and weaknesses in the process of making this film, and become literate in new methods of creating. I was able to realize my artist's vision of a film medium and my scholarly aims of a serious examination of the intersectional feminist perspective through the deeply rewarding process of representing these five brilliant women. I was able to pose the questions that plagued me about how we may continue to exist and organize in this social, political, and historical moment of regression, uncertainty, and unrest. And I was able to bring to completion a project that at one point really felt impossible. Now, to give you an idea of exactly what I've been monologuing about, um, and since the artist can do this topic justice much better than I can, I'd like to show you a preview of my film, which is called Bodies of Work. Uh, for those of you who are interested, there will be a screening of the full-length feature on May 11th in the KHC Common Room at 6 p.m. So, here we go. Are you ready to go, Steph? Yeah, do you have something? Do you want me to get her just in front of them or like? Um, I'm thinking maybe she can kind of walk through and just 
maybe with the big one, tell me a couple things about each, and she can sort of point at them and. I know. Should I put here? I don't know where you want that. I can put this in here. I have other ones too. A collage. So I just have to pull them out. Kind of okay. <clears throat> I need my glasses. Sure, thing. sure. Some of the things that I think about a lot. I was just focused. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I was just like. Yeah. Cool. Fantastic. Okay. I'm Arielle Basson Freiber, and I'm primarily a painter. My name is Nona Faustine, and I'm a visual artist and photographer. My name is Lara Ayad. I am a PhD candidate in the history of art and architecture at Boston University. I thought I was going to focus on photography, and it turns out that I ended up shifting, spending a good deal of my practice doing performance. My name is Maria Maltini. I studied, you know, pretty rigorous observational formal oil painting. I, Boston University, and um, my practice has taken very different directions. Linda um, Nochlin's essay, you know, why have, why have there been no great women artists, um, I think is still, you know, I think she wrote that essay in the early 70s, and it's as if it could be, have been written yesterday. Do you think that artists have a specific social responsibility in the face of injustice or I think they do I'm sorry I just think they do um yes you can make whatever kind of art you want and usually that art is informed by your experience as a human being so if you never really had to struggle if you never had to deal with you know um complex histories of race and class you know maybe your work your work is going to look lot different. Um, but I think that artists have an incredible responsibility. And I think it's naive to um, pretend that that doesn't exist. How art is taught is being framed by a particular power structure or history. I think, I think there are a couple of main reasons that uh, the art canon has traditionally excluded artists and art educators from outside the West. I think, uh, I think that some critics and some historians, as well as curators for that matter, uh, are invested in maintaining what they call the West, however you want to define that, as the center of uh, artistic creativity, the center of artistic genius. Artists don't live in a vacuum. We're not magical. We just are other human beings trying to work out our own theories about who we are and how that plays out in our art practice and how to figure out how to work with that. There are people that are just like born feminists, which I feel like I would, like I like came out of the womb, like you know, just like ready to kill all the men or something. I feel like at one point I was, it just kind of dawned on me that my, um, my hesitation to call myself a feminist and like my sort of potential fear of calling myself a feminist was like um, somehow like I've tried to explain this before, but somehow that um, just made it very clear to me that 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 I should be one. I, I feel that I'm a feminist, so um, I don't have any problem with calling myself that. Just the sheer act of doing something that's not under the framework of the market. I think coming from a feminist point of view is creating a, a life that's not structured around that market. Um, being an artist is already resisting that just inherently. Always for me, it's always like, what are the women doing? How are they experiencing uh, history, their own lives, their own lived experience? But then also too, what are black women doing? How are they mapping out their own future for themselves? For me, intersectionality is, is it's a vibrant and uh, robust way of existing and thinking about uh, Black feminist practice. Intersectionality is not just an issue for Americans. It's also an issue for people outside the West, which, again, I'm really hoping that my work can help to reveal that. In terms of how art, what it offers to the world and what it doesn't, that's a great question. I'm not sure that I have an answer. What I can say is that 
art allows us to use our imaginations, to use our creativity. It allows us to see how artists think. Um, and certainly it mirrors things back to us. I think true change happens like inside you. And I'm like, okay, I'm an artist. Like I, um, my, my like gift or this thing that I can offer the world is to present, um, you know, my values or perspective in like a, you know, a very special particular way that can hopefully get inside a person and ask, get them to ask themselves like, well, how do they feel and what do they do about something? It's, it's, a, it's, it's about visibility. So artists have, you know, this incredible platform. They can put their work out, you know, several different ways. And so, I mean, in, in my, my work broke out really on the internet, you know, when um, Huffington Post wrote this article. And so, you know, I was kind of unprepared for that, but um, it reached so many people. I mean, it reached so many people. So it was quite, in a way, it was a perfect tool. The credit slides are a lot longer than I remember editing. That's okay. That always happens. <laughs> um, so these are the amazing women that I interviewed. I also want to, while I still have a second, uh, quickly thank my advisor, Dana Clancy. She's been instrumental in the process. Um, Professor Preston for getting the ball rolling and giving me some really uh, interesting reading to start my research. Um, the artists, of course, I mean, it wouldn't have been possible without them. Uh, and Steph Hooten and Laura Brock for helping me with the technological monolith that was this project. Uh, and saving me from totally floundering in that respect. Do we have any questions? Yeah. You spoke really talkatively about the difficulty between being a painter and being an academic. But here you stuck behind the camera. So can you speak about your process in term, and the power structure inherent in making a film, in editing, in cutting and splicing? How did you approach it? How did you think about it? <laughs> Well, I think that um, it's sort of funny because I really love to talk, um, but in this case, the talking, you know, all happens sort of behind the scenes, and I made a very conscious choice to mainly leave my voice out of it because it was really important to me that um, that these women really take the stage, and I'm, they had so much to say that. Um, I had no qualms about taking myself out of it. Um, it's true what they say, like the magic really does happen in the editing room um, when you put one clip next to another, but what they don't tell you, I think, is that after you've done a few interviews and a few splices, you start to recognize like the magic moments in real time when you're sitting with the person and suddenly something will come out of their mouth, you know, they'll have this one sentence and it'll just flash into your head, you know, maybe three interviews ago somebody else said the same thing or they said the opposite thing and immediately, you know, I would put the two clips next to each other in my brain. So that was pretty amazing. Um, and I think I gained a lot of skills in terms of interviewing and being able to pull the meat out of the conversation. Like sometimes it's really a fight um, to get to where you want to be, but um, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. <laughs> In terms of the power dynamic, I mean, I wanted to keep it really uh, true to uh, these women's perspectives uh, and sort of not skew anything uh, to create some sort of tone or to aspire to something. Um, I wanted to keep it really genuine. Um, and I let them sort of direct the flow of the conversation uh, if things were going in a, in a certain way. So I feel like it was a really good give and take um, in that respect. 
anyone else? Yeah, Professor Preston. Starting point was to read a bunch of feminist literature mm -hmm. um, and think through feminist theory and try to imagine feminism's relevance for today. Yeah. Did you get answers to that question? I mean, I think Sean put it nicely earlier that maybe artsy projects pose more questions than they do <laughs> create answers. I mean, I have my own opinions, obviously, but I think in interviewing these women, it seemed that there is a bit of shared territory around um, feminism right now really needing to have this intersectional approach, um, and that the idea of feminism for the sake of white middle class women joining white middle class men at the top is really kind of obsolete, um, at least in the demographic that I was interviewing. Um, and they seem to be, despite everything, um, fairly optimistic. You know, we're experiencing a backlash right now. Um, but each one of them sort of ended their interview on a note of, you just have to keep pressing, and this is the, the sort of historical progression of progress is that, you know, it's one step forward, two steps back. So um, the reading that I did did kind of take a back seat once we were doing interviews, but I, it was really lovely how all of those concepts were there just in a much more colloquial and conversational manner, you know? Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Okay, thank you so much.